Welcome to the Do No Harm Podcast, where we discuss the battle to keep politics out of medicine. With our host, Dr. Marilyn Singleton, and Do No Harm's founder, Dr. Stanley Goldfarb. Together, we're talking with people to create a better healthcare system for all, one that's based on medicine, not division. In a world of confusing and contradictory messages about the meaning of male and female, where can families, health professionals, and the public turn for guidance? In a recent Dallas Morning News commentary, that's the question asked by two renowned practicing psychiatrists who currently work with transgender identified youths. Doctors Miriam Grossman and Lauren Schwartz used to believe the gold standard of best practices for mental health clinicians were set by the American Psychiatric Association, known as the APA. But the APA's latest publication titled Gender Affirming Psychiatric Care is a political manifesto masquerading as science. It replaces evidence with medical misinformation and ethics with activism. Fortunately, we have these experts in the field, like Dr. Grossman and Dr. Schwartz, who still believe facts matter. We're honored to have these physicians here today to correct the record. Welcome to the show, doctors. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, let's just let Dr. Stan Goldfarb get this started. Well, thank you very much. And it really is a, a, a real honor to have the two of you who have been incredible leaders in the in the field. Um and and let me let me jump right in with this uh issue about the publication by the uh, American Psychiatric Association, because I think one of the big issues that we've been confronting throughout not only gender care issues, but also in the, the whole question of DEI and in healthcare has been the role of the professional societies and how they've really come out uh, to be a, a problem in, in, in many of these uh, issues. So uh, perhaps uh, you can, we can jump right in and, and sort of talk about this publication, its origins, the, this new uh, handbook, the gender affirming psychiatric care and, and how you all think this, this occurred and what you think should be done about it. Maybe we start with Dr. Grossman on this one. Thank you, Dr. Goldfarb, very, very much for, for having us on. Such a, such a profoundly important issue that we're talking about today, an actual life and death issue. And that is the question of what is the best care that should be provided to young people, including minors, young adults who in distress over their the biological reality of their of their body and whether they are male or female and so we we're, we we're talking today about this the new publication came out in November of last year published by the um American Psychiatric Association called gender affirming psychiatric care so why don't we first just uh make it uh, clear what is gender affirming care. Gender affirming care is essentially calling for all clinicians to rubber stamp the self diagnosis of of even the youngest child and even the most mentally ill child, and make available to that person medical and surgical intervention. So. Medical affir- gender affirmation and a very Orwellian term, I'm sure you'll agree, because we are affirming the individual's uh, delusion that they are something that they cannot be and that they, you know, that their wish to become someone that they can never become because sex is fixed. It's established at conception. So gender affirming care requires clinicians to rubber stamp this self diagnosis. And the book that came out certainly does 
tell us that. It instructs psychiatrists, psychologists, other mental health professionals, and really everyone in the, in every health provider. And it instructs us to automatically accept and in fact celebrate these identities. So that in a nutshell is what the book is about. The book is, is extremely troubling. It, it, it's really an abandonment of, of professional standards filled with, with misinformation about the medical interventions, for example, stating that puberty blockers are completely safe and reversible. Something, it's quite an outrageous claim at this point to make since we know we have so much evidence to the contrary. It says that the man-woman binary is quote-unquote mythical. It claims that gender diversity would flourish if not for European colonial influence. So you get my drift over here. This is a radical gender manifesto. Thank you, Dr. Oh, thank you, Dr. Grossman. What I want to know, you're saying all this, and this is coming out of the American Psychiatric Association, which presumably is the key association that psychiatrists go to when they're looking for guidelines, they're looking for the best answers for things. Um, Dr. Schwartz, what, what do psychiatrists in the real world think of some of this? And I think that's such an important distinction to make. So I do, I appreciate you having us, us both on to discuss this because I think when those of us that are in practice, you know, in practicing psychiatry, but also practicing medicine or pediatrics, neurology, um, and even extending out into the mental health field, counselors, therapists, et cetera, they look to, you know, to the American Psychiatric Association as kind of the world, and this is kind of their, their, these are their words, the world's largest and most influential psychiatric organization. So, you know, it's one thing to see some political advocacy, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, and now it's just such a departure from anything scientific. Um, and I think that's where it's so dangerous. You look at this leading influencer um, in terms of medical education. So any tr- any doctors in training, any psychologists or therapists in training, continuing medical education in this field, the APA claims to be the most up-to-date, the most peer-reviewed, the best source of resources for education and ongoing medical care in the mental health field. And so when the I think when its claims don't match its content, you get into a very dangerous situation. And so I think that's where it seems to have really steered off course with this textbook. You know, given the the fact that the American Psychiatric Association is held up as such a, you know, such an important organization, and also given the fact that at least in my experience, psychiatrists among are amongst the most cultured and you know, sort of um, well-rounded intellectually people in medicine because of their interest in the way people think and act as the goal. How did how did this happen? How did this organization suddenly end up with this kind of approach? Well, again, it's not unique to the American Psychiatric Association, but this is the one that I, I'm sort of most surprised about. And I think that's Either our question. Yeah. yeah, I think that's our question in not only our op-ed, but also the letter that we wrote to the American Psychiatric Association. It now has over 7,000 signatures, but no response from the actual APA. So it's, I think that's where we're confused. Um, it definitely departs from kind of the rank and file members of the APA. I am still one of them. I've, I was excited to join as a trainee. I was thrilled when I was um, granted fellowship um, and was very proud to be a part of an association that, you know, as it moves forward, has really done tremendous damage with this book and with its approach. Miriam, any thoughts about the origins here? of this these ideas amongst the leadership of this important organization well you know well gender ideology had its 
its origins really with a psychologist, with John, you know, going back to John Money. I don't, I don't know that he would even recognize what his gender theory, you know, of the 50s and 60s, what it has evolved to look at, to, to look like at this point. I don't, I, I don't know what he could say about this, this particular textbook because his idea all the way, you know, back then, was that uh, male and female stereotypes, behavior, feelings were a social construct and completely separate from biology. And, you know, as I explain in, in my book, Lost in Transnation, this idea of his evolved, kind of went through decades of reinterpretation by radical feminists and, you know, gender ideologues, you know, to, to the point where they're just saying, you know, the body is wrong, the mind right, and we need to adjust the body in order to uh, make it align with, with the mind. And this is, I agree with you, Dr. Goldfarb, it, it's a very bizarre thing for psychiatrists to be claiming, right? Because we believe that we have to look at what's going on in the mind. And we have to look at a person's uh, background and, you know, family and history of trauma and perhaps comorbidities like depression, autism. And we have to look at, at, at that, you know, huge impact of all those things on each person when they present to us with a symptom. But here we have psychiatrists backing this book that essentially says if someone has this unique kind of distress about being male or female, the only solution is to refigure their bodies. We do not look at their what's going on in their psyche. We don't look at their history, their family relationships, anything like that. We just you know, we change their bodies. We take chemicals and we give young kids blockers, hormones that will prevent the completely natural organic process of puberty that everyone needs to go through in order to become an adult. They're, they're saying we should just block that. We should freeze these kids in, in the developmental stage of prepubescence or early puberty and freeze the development of their bodies and their brains, and then give them supra-physiological amounts of opposite-sex hormones. Just a massive experiment on youth that ends up sterilizing many of them. So you're right, Dr. Gopher. I mean, for psychiatrists of all specialties in medicine, that would put their stamp of approval on this, you would not expect it to be psychiatrists. Yeah. I have a question about this, and, and I'll ask this of Dr. Schwartz. I, In my mind, and I'm not one of those brilliant psychiatrists, how do you match that with how anorexia nervosa is treated, where a person has an image of themselves that, isn't correct do we encourage it do psychiatrists tell them go ahead starve yourself and i just i just don't see how you square this sort of transgender thing where the mind is correct but the body's wrong with how you treat anorexia nervosa patients what do you think doctor well and i think you you can't you don't square it with it you know of course a especially if it was a child, but any patient struggling with an eating disorder, um, affirming their view of their own body, um, their view that their body isn't, isn't right, that we would somehow affirm that, agree with those distortions, and then either medicalize, like would we put them on, you know, uh, medicines that would allow them to lose even more weight, even if they were in dangerous, um, dangerously low weight, categories to begin with, where their heart is at risk, their body systems are at risk. Um, you know, and I think one of the things to remember about all of this is we're talking about 
a textbook that reaches out and touches not just psychiatry, it touches pediatrics and it touches um, neurology and endocrinology. And you always take the least invasive approach with kids. You protect that developmental process because it's so intricate. That's why with eating disorders, you've got to support and help the child um, and or young adult recognize what they're struggling with, why they're struggling with it. Is it fed by you know, there can be 10,000 reasons why they're struggling with something and you treat holistically, you treat the entire patient. And this is such a departure from that. You take the patient's word, you know, the gender dysphoria or, or feelings on gender, and then you medicalize the body to match that, that sense, which like you said, um, Dr. Singleton, you can't square that with anything else that we do, whether it's eating disorders or any other um, psychiatric diagnoses. Let me let me ask uh, you both of you to put on your hats of being, uh, um, I hope not Cassandra's, but at least predictors of the future. So we've recently seen that uh, some WPATH uh, materials have come out to show that um, these the people that are most advocate for these this approach that's the world professional. I always get this transgender health group or something like that. And and they've been held up as sort of the the, the real experts in the field, and the, their guidelines have been followed by a number of organizations. But it turns out that they um, they acknowledge that informed consent it really doesn't exist amongst amongst these kids. So given that's come out, given what's gone on in Europe, where there's been a big curtailment in the in some of these treatments in several countries, where do you think this is all going? Where do you think we're going to be in in a year or two? in this field? Well, I'm actually very optimistic. I I think that the evidence against so-called gender-affirming care is just so formidable at this point. And for those of us that are really sort of, you know, in the trenches, there's news items, you know, there's articles or developments from abroad that, uh, come out, it seems like every few days now, that there's more and more evidence. I mean, the WPATH files, of course, was, was, was one big event. Many of us were aware for a long, long time that WPATH, uh, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, you know, holding themselves up as global authorities, creating so-called standards of care. This is the organization that doctors, clinics, hospitals, and even courts, you know, would turn to for, you know, for, for guidance on how do we, how do we help these people? And now there, there can really, there really is no question. I mean, we already knew that WPATH for at least the past 20 years has been run by activists and their goal is affirmation at all costs no gatekeeping whatsoever. So in the WPATH files that came out, and I also have a lot of this in my book, we we heard and read how clinicians from that organization, when they didn't know that outsiders would be listening to them or reading what they had to say, are really scratching their heads and saying, look, you know, I, I have this sort of patient who's extremely mentally ill and wants to go through medical or surgical transition, you know, is this really a wise idea? I And someone else writes about, well, it was Dr. Daniel Metzger, the endocrinologist, talks about how, you know, a 14-year-old is in no way or, or fashion able to comprehend what it means to take a medication that might impact their sexual functioning or fertility later in life. And he acknowledges that. And he says that that's always bothered him. And yet he, they're saying that they have to nevertheless plow on, go ahead and give all these treatments to kids. They acknowledge the evidence is very weak. They're, um, sharing their insecurities and concerns. And as a doctor, it's really, it's, it's very chilling to read those WPATH files. So the evidence now, like I said, of gender affirming care 
uh, against it, having having no medical basis, no scientific basis, and 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 all the evidence of harm that results from it, it's just formidable. And uh, you know, we're having success state by state. Um, not every single state is a success, but we are successful in terms of legislation in many places. But more than that, I think parents are waking up and I think the mainstream media is waking up for the New York Times to publish those few articles about what schools are doing behind parents' backs, about the dangers of puberty blockers. And then we have, you know, in in Alberta, Canada, the prime minister there, Danielle Smith, coming out and making puberty blockers and other interventions unavailable to minors. These are very, very big events. So I'm actually quite optimistic. It's just that the body count is high. Yeah. How about you, Dr. Schwartz? Your your views? Do you, do you are you consistent with Dr. Grossman's views? Oh, absolutely. I am I'm very hopeful um that now as I think more and more folks are waking up. Um, that's incredibly helpful. You know, the double WPATH files, um, like Dr. Grossman said, was, you know, I think a turning point in terms of shedding light on the actual inner workings of WPATH, you know, in gender affirming psychiatric care. They mention um, and reference the WPATH and their standards of care at least 14 times that I counted. Um, so to me, now that not just the WPATH files, but um, I would encourage anyone to read her book, Lost in Transnation, because she's been grappling with this and trying to make parents and families and clinicians aware of this for decades. You know, I came to the table quite a bit later, I would say 2017, 2018. So I had a lot of catching up to do. I know right now there's going to be a lot of catching up for a lot of folks that are they're going to have to do this now. I think that American Psychiatric Association can no longer claim to be unaware. Um, they shouldn't have been able to do that before and ignore all the systematic reviews that have been done internationally um, that are the highest standards of care. Those are not mentioned. They're completely omitted in this book. Um, but now I think this sheds even more light on what they were using as quote unquote standards of care. And we all know this working in the medical field, but I think the public doesn't recognize standards of care is a legal term. And even the WPATH themselves say, we call this the standards of care, but it's actually just guidelines. These are just guidelines to follow. It doesn't actually represent a true standard of care. So I think the APA and then clinicians following that will have to start to take responsibility for putting so many children, so many families, so many patients in tremendous danger. So yeah, I absolutely agree with um, Dr. Grossman and, and her hope. Well, doctors, I'm going to ask each of you separately, and I'm sure Dr. Grossman's book, Lost in Transnation, could be a manual for folks, but to end it where we began, what do you tell health professionals and, more importantly, parents when they're faced with these transgender issues with their children? Dr. Grossman? Uh, gosh, um, well, if we could talk for a few hours, we could <laughs> But I, I know I know that we can't. Well, what I say first of all is that parents need to get educated so that they understand this issue. Almost every family that has come to me uh, has just been in a position of ignorance uh, when when their child made the announcement. They don't. Some of them don't even know what the child is even talking about. They've never even hardly heard of this. They don't understand it. They don't know, of course, how to respond. Sometimes they believe that the thing to do is to take the child to a gender therapist. You do not want to take your child to a gender affirming therapist. Hmm. You want to run the other direction away from a gender affirming therapist. But the other thing for parents is that they're isolated and there's no need for that. So along with instructing parents to please, you know, to get educated on this issue, and there's also a lot, tons and tons of information on my website, miriamgrossmanmd.com, aside from the book, but there are so many groups and so many resources that are available now to parents. 
that wasn't the case a few years ago. And parents were terribly isolated because they would often feel they're the, they're the only people, you know, in, in the world almost, you know, who, who believe that they have to stand for reality and stand for, you know, the, the, the truth of their, their child's biological sex and not let go of that. It can seem sometimes for these parents that everyone, the whole world, the school, the therapist, the pediatrician, the, you know, the people in our, in our, in our government and our government agencies, child protective services, let alone the entertainment field, you know, everything. They can, they can feel extremely isolated and they shouldn't. So, you know, more than that, you know, just in a nutshell, what parents want to do is to affirm the child's emotions, but not affirm the child's false belief of being the opposite sex or being non-binary or some you know meaningless term that that is but feelings are not wrong so if your child is confused angry frustrated afraid those all those feelings are legitimate and parents want to acknowledge them and affirm them and be with their child supporting them with those emotions they that does not mean that they support this idea of having a different identity. That does not mean that they necessarily agree to a new name, pronouns, and puberty blockers in no you know, way, shape, or fashion. But there is so much to say here, and <laughs> that is why I wrote this long 300-page book. And I do have within the book, actually, a model conversation and Dr. Schwartz and I worked closely, and I thank you, Dr. Schwartz, very, very much for helping me come up with this model conversation between a parent and their child when the child presents, you know, with this declaration. And it's a conversation that will be helpful to parents, even if their child, you know, is nowhere near all of it, this whole entire issue, because parents do need to be prepared. No family is immune. This is happening everywhere, not only in, you know, blue cities, but everywhere, Catholic schools, you name it, Jewish Orthodox schools, it's happening everywhere. So parents need to be prepared. Well, thank you, Dr. Grossman. And Dr. Schwartz will let you, you give some final words of wisdom. Sure. And I think just to, to echo what Dr. Grossman is, Dr. Grossman is saying, you know, I talk with families and especially parents all the time that you are the expert, um, beyond anyone else in your child. You've known them since they were born. You will be there far after their teachers or therapists or doctors have treated them and, and moved on or they've moved on or graduated on. So don't ever doubt that no matter what, you know your child better than anyone else. Um, and just as I think we see a lot of these, whether it's gender affirming psychiatric care textbook or the, a the American Academy of Pediatrics or American Medical Associ Association saying affirm early and often, my take is talk with your children early and often. Um, like Dr. Grossman said, no one's immune. And even if your child isn't in the midst of struggling with this, they may have a friend struggling with it. They may be a part of a um, program at school that you're not aware of. So it really does help your child as well as, as you as a parent to know about it, to understand it, to be able to have those conversations, to hold reality for your child, even when they're going to try and maybe push back on it or reality is not what they want to face in that moment, you want your child to grow and develop a growth mindset, not a fixed version of themselves. And I think very much affirming gender does create a very fixed view of self. And we want to do the opposite of that. We want them to be able to be flexible and, and deal with all the different um, ups and downs that life life's going to throw at us and we hold reality for them when it's sometimes too difficult for them to, um, you know, and then they can develop their own sense of self and own filter when they're developmentally able to. As a child, they cannot do that. So yeah, just early and often sit down, have these conversations with your kids and you are the experts in your, your children's lives. 
Thank you so much. And as we all know, just as with anything in medicine, it begins with love and compassion, and you move on from there. So we'd like to thank you for coming on the show. This has been so edifying, and I hope everybody's learned a lot from this. And we need more rational and courageous people like you out there in medicine. And hopefully people will take note and uh, we'll have the information about uh, Dr. Grossman's book. And I hope everybody can get it and read those model conversations. So I would just like to thank you again for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. And I'd like to thank everyone for listening. And thank you for supporting our efforts to protect patients and physicians and healthcare itself from divisive audiology. Please visit us at donoharmmedicine.org. And thank you again for listening. 